Well, welcome everybody. This is the virtual San Diego Comic-Con 2020 fantasy and science fiction author panel. And I'd like to, introdu to introduce our uh, amazing and talented guests. Alphabetically, Peter Kleins is the New York Times bestselling author of Paradox Bound and Dead Moon, Terminus, and the X Heroes series. The acclaimed 14, The Eerie Adventures of the Lycanthrope Robinson Crusoe. I love mashups. Numerous short stories, several of them collected in Dead Men Can't Complain and other stories, and an as yet undiscovered Dead Sea Scroll. Nice. Fonda Lee writes science fiction and fantasy for adults and teens. She's the author of the Greenbone Saga, beginning with Jade City, which won the 2018 World Fantasy Award for Best Novel, was nominated for the Nebula Award, the Locus Award, and was named a Best Book of 2017 by NPR, Barnes & Noble, Sci-Fi, and others. The second book in the Greenbone saga, Jade War, received multiple starred reviews. Fonda's young adult science fiction novels, Zero Boxer, Exo, and Crossfire have garnered accolades, including being named Junior Library Guild Selection, Andre Norton Award finalist, Oregon Book Award finalist, Oregon, Books, Oregon Spirit Book Award winner, and Yalza Top 10 Quick Pick for reluctant young adult readers. Kirsten White is the New York Times bestselling and Bram Stoker award-winning author of the And I Darken Trilogy, the Paranormal Sea Trilogy, The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein, Slayer, The Guinevere Deception, and many other novels. Kirsten lives with her family in sunny San Diego, where she perpetually lurks in the shadows and gives awkward hugs. I'm your moderator, Henry Hertz. I've authored 11 books for children, including Two Pirates Plus One Robot, Alice's Magic Garden, which is a prequel to Alice in Wonderland, and Monster Goose Nursery Rhymes. I've sold four children's short stories to highlights for children in Cricket, and I've also written 14 fantasy and sci-fi and horror short stories for adult anthologies. Okay, with that, let's get started. So, so I'm gonna ask the panel some questions and we'll just see where it takes us. So question one, do you have a preference for heroes that are born great or have greatness thrust upon them? Anyone? Personally? Oh. Oh. Go ahead, Go ahead. Peter. Oh. <laughs> um, personally, I think it's always, this is again just my preference, but I always think having the greatness thrust upon you is always better. I mean, if someone's born the hero, born great, born to be topical with all the advantages with everything, it doesn't mean as much when they accomplish things. Um, I mean, my personal favorite hero when I was a kid was uh, Taryn, the assistant pig keeper from Lloyd Alexander's books, who goes on through the course of the books to become this great war hero and the High King. Hey, spoiler but, alert. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you didn't get it from the, the title of the fifth book. <laughs> but yeah, I think greatness, greatness thrust upon you, a good way to put it, is always a better, to me, a better story. I have a bit of a hard time answering this question because thinking back on my books, I realize now that I write a lot of characters where greatness is expected of them and they have a hard time living up to it. So in a way I'm writing characters where they, um, they're not exactly born great, but they're born into circumstances in which they're expected to be great or they have to live up to being great and yet they, they have to figure out how to do that and they have to um, come to terms with the fact that that doesn't come easy that's not something that they're that they're naturally born with and there's this constant struggle of like can i live up to what everyone expects of me okay. yeah i wrote um i wrote a buffy the vampire slayer spin-off series uh the first book of which is called slayer and the second book of which is called chosen um and surprisingly they're entirely about what it means to be chosen um, and because I feel like with so many um, mythos, we, we get this, like, you're the chosen one, um, but being the chosen one means it was chosen for you, you didn't choose. And right. I love, especially with Slayers, where it's teenage girls who are suddenly given these extraordinary abilities, but along with that, expected to basically sacrifice their lives to uh, protect other humans. Um, you didn't choose that. No one would choose that. And, and what that means, what do you do with that when you're given this power and this calling that um, you didn't choose? And in the case of my Slayer, Nina, is, is sort of um, the opposite of how she views herself because she views herself as like 
a healer and someone who takes care of other people. So having this power that she views as destructive is, is um, creates this huge conflict in her. Uh, and, and I like that because I, I like, I love the, I love the um, coming into greatness, but I also love the idea that sometimes we're given powers and responsibilities that we didn't ask for and, um, and what that can do um, to us both positive and negative. I would just add from, from the picture book perspective that it's you're kind of expected that your character is going to grow, but it's kind of nice when you give them, you can have both, right? You can give them, they have some superpower or some, something they're really good at, but that's not what's being tested. So they have to, they have to grow in another area. So you can, you can actually do both. I'd say. I, actually, could I ask a, a minor follow-up? Yeah, sure. Anyone? I was curious, Fonda, because you said your characters are, are expected to be great are they is the greatness that's expected of them the greatness they need for the story if mm. that makes sense yeah 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 um you know y yes and no so i i find that a lot of my characters the greatness that's ex expected of them is coming from um from their family and or from their society and um there's a lot of like how do i live up to this that um, these characters feel like they're not innately born with. And so there's this aspect of, um, first of all, do I want this expectation? Do I want to live up to what my family is expecting of, it, of me? I don't know, maybe it comes from being a second generation Asian American and having, you know, the, the parental like, you know, like expectations placed on you to make a better life for the family and so on. Um, maybe that's where it comes from. But, uh, but there's, there's that. And then um, also, they realize that maybe the expectations that are being placed on them aren't the ones that are the, aren't necessarily what is going to kind of be their story arc, if you will. So there's, there's kind of the external pressures, which may or may not line up to what they personally have to go through as a character over the course of that story. Great. Thank you. Uh, this came from uh, social media. Um, how you construct a story? How do you construct a story world that reflects the character's inner dilemma, or what factors play into the story world you construct, and what's that process like? I heard a really great um, quote once. I can't even remember who said it, but um, I remember one author telling me, you know, a great way to construct your story is if you have a character in mind, think about what is the worst problem that this character could face? Like, what are they uniquely ill-suited to deal with? And if you have a um, plot or a story world in mind, think about who is worst equipped to deal with this. So um, as authors, we're always trying to put our characters in the worst possible situation um, and make everything harder for them. So, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's one way to think about it is, how do you ratchet up the stakes by doing that? Um, and in the case of, I'll, I'll take the example of um, my, uh, my young adult series, I like to put them in really morally ambiguous situations. So I have a character who um, is on a, if this is my um, series EXO and Crossfire, there's a, um, a colonizing race where Earth is under control by an alien race. And it would have been easy for me to pick a character and right from the point of view of a character who is trying to topple this uh, this alien co uh, colonial power. Um, and so I was like, well, I'm gonna write a character who is actually has a lot of um, to gain from being part of the existing regime. And he's the son of, you know, the state leader and he's expected to um, to, to basically foster interspecies cooperation and coexistence on this planet and he runs into the rebels and how so how do you like put these characters in situations where there there's a moral dilemma or a personal dilemma and there's like no right answer and they're caught between a rock and a hard place as opposed to the <laughs> protagonist of andy darken who has no qualms and n nothing ambiguous about her feelings yeah yeah, uh, yeah, that one was a fun one to write because I did have the character who who struggled with things morally, um, Radu, and then I had Lada who was like, "I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do, however I have to do it," um, which was really which was really freeing to write. Um, yeah, I I think 
particularly when you come down to the craft of writing, when it comes to world building, especially for fantasy, um, when I talk to young writers, a lot of times if they want to write fantasy, they start telling me about this world that they've developed and the cultures and the history and, and they keep going on and on about the world and the magic systems. And I can tell they have put in hundreds of hours to detailing this world. And, um, and my advice to them is always stop world building. You got to write. Um, you got to create characters because I think as fantasy writers, you can get so fixated on, on the world and on the act of creating this entire world that um, you forget it. It's not the story. The story isn't the world. The story is the characters who are moving through it. Um, and so oftentimes I advise them to just like pause on the world building. Don't even worry about it. Find your characters, find your story, and let that inform the type of world that you're building around them. Because like Fonda was saying, then you can have your characters engage with the world in the most interesting and dynamic way. Um, because the world then, you know, the setting and the history functions almost as another character to sort of um, create tension with your characters and your narrative. Um, because, you know, world building is hugely important when writing science fiction and fantasy, but it has to serve the story and the characters first and foremost, and not exist as its own wonderful, incredible thing, which it, it can be so fun. But, you know, we're, we're creating stories, we're writing books, we're not creating worlds. And so you've got you've to kind of balance that and make sure that your world is serving your story and not the other way around. Okay. Yeah, I, I kind of agree that they've nailed it and not left me with much to say. Uh, but I think for me personally, I tend to do, when I write my first drafts are very much uh, straight plot, some story. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in a, a little thing I heard years back uh, from a writer named Shane Black, who's a screenwriter, sometimes director, uh, did little indie films like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Iron Man 3, stuff like that. Uh, but he has this whole thing that plot is what's going on outside your characters and story is what's going on inside your characters. And so I'm a big believer when I go through, I've generally got a good idea for the plot and a good idea for my story, for my individual characters. And at the end of my first draft, I can sort of look back and see like, okay, now I know where I need to tie things together. And that's what my second draft pass usually is. I, I do a lot more world building in my second draft than I do. And usually it's world building, like Fonda was saying, to make things more difficult for everybody. That now that I know what the plot requires and I know what my characters are, are trying to deal with, I can say, okay, what would make this harder to deal with? What's the worst thing that could happen here? What's the worst thing, you know, the, the book I'm writing right now, I've got this guy who's like basically on the run with a minor and as they're fleeing from government labs super soldiers all this absolutely the dumbest worst thing that can happen is they actually get pulled over for speeding so right in the middle of all this we suddenly have to deal with two dumb yokel cops who have stopped us in the middle of nowhere when we have you know literally hell coming after us and we don't have time for delay but that's second draft stuff so Nice. I would just add one thing uh, for short form. Uh, you don't always have, you, you've, by virtue of it being short form, you know, a short story, 5,000 words, you, you don't have the luxury of a lot of world building, but you can get a lot of world building mileage out of just swapping out everyday things we're familiar with with something different. So a story I'm working on right now, instead of a hardwood, this is a sci-fi story takes place on an alien world. Instead of a hardwood dance floor, it's plasteel, stealing plasteel from Asimov or somebody, or instead of a devil's food cake, it's a Denevian slime devil foods cake, food cake. You know, just little tweaks to everyday objects can you get a lot of world building mileage out of that. Okay, so we have a, ge a generalized question about process, planning an organization. Who's a pantser, who's a plotter, and, and why? I, I hate that question. <laughs> oh. You can right, pass. You can phone a friend. Um, no, it's fine. It's, I, I think people ask that because they want to find the right way to construct a book. And the, the fact of the matter is there's not a right way to construct a book. 
um, some of my books I've had to plan out very carefully, like the Anti-Dark Trilogy is historical fiction, so it was informed by thousands of pages of research and detailed historical outlines. Um, some of my books, like the Guinevere Deception, I knew I wanted to write an Arthurian retelling. I knew I wanted to be centered around Guinevere. I went to my friend Stephanie Perkins' house. I sat on her couch, and I started with the first line, and by the end of the week, I had an entire first draft. Um, Can we all use so, Stephanie's couch? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yes. So, so my my main writing advice is find your best friend's couch. Um, <laughs> no, and, and and I think that you know I'm I'm sixteen, seventeen books into my career. I've written more than twenty, and the one thing that it comes down to is find the right process for that book. It might not be the same thing that worked before. It might be the same thing that worked before, um, but but don't lock yourself into this is the right way to write a book because the only right way to write a book is to do it. And that changes book to book. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I, I don't have 20 books under my belt yet, but I have six and I feel like every single one of those was written differently. And oftentimes it's because they come to you differently. So my debut, Zero Boxer, it came to me plot first. So I had kind of like the plot twist at the end was the thing that came to me first. And so then I built everything else backing off of that. And then my um, next two books, the duology, Exo and Crossfire, the character came to me first. So then I was doing world building and like fleshing out the rest of the story around what I knew this character's journey was going to be. And then my um, Greenbone Saga, the, um, the epic urban fantasy adult trilogy that I'm working on now, the world came to me first. I had this, re this really clear vision of what the world was going to be and the, and, um, you know, that, the sort of aesthetic, the tone that I wanted. And I didn't have any characters. And it ended up being an extremely character focused story. But I had to then, I had to spend the time to kind of flesh each of those characters out and figure out how this multi POV complex thing was going to happen. And each of those writing processes was also very di different. Zero Bucks are similar to what Kirsten said. I sat down, wrote from page one to like the end. And then my most recent book, Jade War, it was multi POV, different covering large time span over different um, locations. And so I was like writing it almost in parallel. I would have like characters that I would write number of chapters and another character I'd write a number of chapters and then I'd be like working on it like a giant Rubik's cube puzzle trying to like figure out how the pieces fit together. So I almost feel like pantsing and plotting is a very, it's a very simplistic way of looking at it because every author, and once you write enough books, you have to be able to do both depending on what the book is calling for at that moment. And um, I think that anyone who starts off saying, oh, I'm, I'm for sure, I'm a hard plotter, outliner, at some point realizes they have to throw it away and um, and be free to f dig around in the weeds for a bit to figure out how to get out of a mess. And those who say I'm a total pantser realize at some point, yeah, it is a good idea to learn some skills of sitting down and thinking stuff through ahead of time, even if it's to get you through like these next three chapters that you're stuck on. So um, every professional author that I know eventually kind of learns the tools of both plotting and pantsing in order to be able to tackle a variety of stories. Yeah, I think, I think Panzer and Plotter are very, like Vonda was saying, a very simplistic way of looking at it because there is no right process. I think one of the, the downsides to all the information we have available to us is you, you start off as a fledgling writer and you, you can actually see a writer that you respect, you admire, and go, oh, so-and-so does this, and they do this in the morning and this in the afternoon, and they prepare this way and they do that. And you know, so many people will try to do that for a month, for a year before they finally admit this is not working for me, if they ever admit it. And I think one of the biggest things as a writer is to figure out what process works best for you, that we take in all these little bits of, you know, writing in the morning, writing in Comic Sans font, starting with the ending, yes. starting with the beginning, you know, starting with characters, starting with plot, pantsing, plotting, all of that. And, and slowly figure out which one is the best one for us. I, and then also admitting it's going to change over time. Um, my first book, X Heroes, I wrote off like three pages of random notes. Um, same with my book 14. I think I had, I don't think I had that much. I think I like two and a half, maybe three pages of just random notes. It'd be cool if there was this and this and someone with that name and that's it. 
And my last book, Terminus, I think I had a 26 page outline for just beat, 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 because it was a super complex story and I had to have it all right. Um, but that was what worked for that book. So you should have, thank you, Peter. I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. For those of you not familiar with the terms, especially yeah. in the era of COVID, pantser does not mean somebody who wears pants or doesn't wear pants. It means writing by the seat of your pants as opposed to outlining everything. Uh, I should have said that before. I also want to point out one little, uh, Kirsten dropped a secondary tidbit in her response, which was uh, someone as talented and successful as her, not everything she writes sells. And the lesson there is don't, you write a great first novel, but it just doesn't sell, don't stop. I think that's also a good tidbit for writing in general to realize that, you know, you can write your 130,000 first draft manuscript and eventually just telling you, wow, 15,000 of these words serve no purpose. That, I mean, uh, my book Paradox Bound, the editor and I actually cut two full chapters out of the book. Like just beginning to end, no editing on either end, just snip, gone. Um, and it, it was the right thing to do that sometimes you're going to, don't assume because you're writing it, it's gold and never needs to go away. So. Good. Thank you. Uh, next question. How do you create your world or characters or gadgets or plot without falling into cliches and, and just making new takes on traditional or previous writers works? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna propose that maybe that I disagree with the premise of that question, but go for it. Like I think it's fine to tweak what other people have done. I think the catch is is that most, if you're doing a sci-fi world or a fantasy world, most gadgets are trying to solve similar problems. It's that uh, the sharks and dolphins thing that sharks and dolphins are incredibly far away from an evolutionary point of view but they evolved into basically the same creature because they're solving all the same problems. So the fact that you're making a magical lock pick and I'm making a mechanical lock pick and fun is making a nanite lock pick. And I don't know. Kirsten's Kirsten, kicking the door. Down. Kirsten, Kirsten has little tiny demons in a jar that go into the lock and move the tumbler, but we're all just solving the same problems with it. So it's an, it's, inevitable that there's going to be a comparison between this and that. I think it's just the coming up with a clever way to reveal it, what you've done or how you've done it. So. Anything to add ladies? Yeah, I feel like, I feel like this idea that you can write something entirely original that doesn't participate or engage with anything that came before is, is entirely wrong. You can't. Um, all stories participate in stories that have come before. Um, and I say this as someone who's written a lot of retellings as well. Um, but I think one of the things that you can do is, is make everything feel personal and specific to your story. Um, so for example, in the Guinevere Deception, I wanted to have a magic system and I have the big like Merlin, Lady of the Lake, um, elemental magic system, but I wanted another very human, very personal, very finite magic system. And um, I was reading a book called The Malleus Malvicarum, which is a terrible book that was used to do terrible things. Um, it was a witch hunter manual from the Middle Ages. And it's so stupid. Like the things that he says and the ways that you figure out someone's, someone's a witch are absolutely absurd and infuriating because they actually use these things to persecute and, and kill women. Um, but one of the things that he's really obsessed with is knots. So he's always like, if you, if you aren't feeling well, go into your attic. And if there's a rope up there with a knot in it, it means that your conveniently independent female neighbor who you don't like is cursing you. Um, maybe your horse isn't running as fast as it used to. Well, go look in its mane. And if there are knots in it, its mane, it means your neighbor who you don't like, who happens to be an independent woman, is cursing you. Um, and he kept he kept coming back to these knots. And so I thought, well, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that away from the Malleus Malvicarum. And I'm going to give it to women as a way of nodding and creating protection and power into their world. Because it felt like a very sort of intimate thing. You could do it in hair. You could do it in sewing. All these little things that women have control over that people in power and men are just going to overlook. They're not going to notice. And so um, I took that and I made it into an entire magic system in, 
in um, my Camelot Rising trilogy. And, and I love doing things like that because you're, you're taking something that existed, but then you're turning it into something very specific and very personal to that world and those characters and that story. And I think in doing that, um, it doesn't matter that there might be similar magic systems in other books. Um, it's great if there are, it just makes it feel so specific and so personal to this book that those comparisons don't don't really matter or they don't detract from what you've created because yeah you like you you can't you can't create something that's never been done before but you can make sure that everything that's in your book feels like it exists only for your book yeah i completely agree with that and um one thing i tell a lot of beginning writers is that the world building serves your story not the other way around so magic and tech are tools they're not, you know, the, they're, they're not in the story just for the sake of being the story. So um, one of the things I will always push um, beginning writers to do is to be deliberate in their world building choices. Like why, if, if you're writing a magic, if you're writing a fantasy story, why is your, why are there elves? You know, not necessarily, it's not that you can't have elves, but why elves? Like, why is it that, um, you know, you've chosen to use elves and if you're going to use elves, you know, what is it that you're bringing to elves that's different, that's you, that's, that's not just, well, it was the easy thing to do because I've read a lot of other books with elves, you know, and are they elves, you know, does the fact that they're elves contribute something to this story or are they literally just humans with pointy ears? So um, are you are you engaging with the magic or the tech in your speculative fiction in a way that is deliberate, that does something for the story and that puts your particular author stamp on? And, um, and you know, there, you, of course you're going to be pulling stuff from things you've read and consumed and things in your own life because that is what um what what art is oftentimes it's just stealing other stuff and and putting your own spin on it um there was this this book um by an author named austin cleon called steal like an artist and the whole premise premise of it is basically like that's how you make art is you steal all the cool stuff from around you and and you mix and mash it up. Um, so like the Greenbone Saga, for example, is basically a mashup of stuff that I like. It's, you know, tropes from gangster uh, fiction and it's Kung Fu magic system and it's epic fantasy and it's, um, you know, Asian inspired set and it's like all mashed together. And then the craft is in how do you take these things that you have pulled from other areas or other fiction, other media and weave it together in a way that feels really organic and feels um, like it's its own new thing that only you could have come up with. Literary paella. Well, we're running short on time. So I got one more question. I would ask you all to uh, try to be brief and uh, then I'll wrap it up. Um, it's 2020 and it wouldn't be a, a Comic-Con panel without asking about pandemic. So, um, the question I got, pandemic is changing society dramatically, not to mention social unrest and hopefully reformation of social ailments. Suddenly it feels like anything we speculate about in the near future, if wrong, will instantly date our work. How are you dealing with these factors or planning to deal with them? Must we all write decades ahead if we were to write contemporary science fiction? Have at it. Write Arthurian literature, and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I, I've been, I, I will admit, I've had the exact thought like, oh, thank goodness that I don't write anything contemporary or in the future. <laughs> well, Peter, X Heroes feels pretty, I mean, do you want to take a stab at this? Because you do well, write this stuff. I, I do. And I think one, one thing to keep in mind, every book any of us writes is going to be dated at some point or another. Um, I, I know people always say stuff like, oh, don't drop in names of cars or tech or movies or songs because you're, it's going to date your book instantly. Like everything is going to date your book. The world you're writing in dates your book. Um, the world you think you're writing in. Because how many of us grew up reading sci-fi novels set in the far-flung future of 2015 on Mars <laughs> colonies? And, you know... I'm so what? disappointed. I feel like I was really 
You know, Seriously. Uh, I, 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 there's a lot of false advertising. Like, where are my flying cars, Peter? Like, like every, everything. I, I, we didn't get a Thundar catastrophe. No. We didn't get a Space 1999. We didn't get aliens in 2010. Nothing. <laughs> but no matter what you do, it's going gonna, it's gonna to date it. In my book 14, uh, my book 14 begins at this Hollywood icon restaurant, The Cat and the Fiddle. It's this iconic place. It's been there forever. And two years after the book came out, the restaurant closed. So it's like, so immediately my book is dated from this. Um, there's an old Fred Saberhagen book I read recently that I love called An Old Friend of the Family. It's a Drac one of his Dracula books. And it occurred to me rereading it. I hadn't read it since I was a teenager. Literally, if any character in this had a cell phone, the book would have ended on that page. Like this book would have been done page 15 if one character had a cell phone. And then you can sort of go through and check, and right here, it would have been done if this person had a cell phone. It would have been done here. Um, anything we do dates our work. So I'm still just writing. I mean, I'm, I'm mid-book. I have scenes with, in a bar. I have, you know, scenes of people in crowds. I have scenes of people doing this. And I have, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I sat there going, oh, God, should everyone be wearing a mask? Should everyone be doing this? Should everyone be doing this? And eventually we just have to write and acknowledge that the world is constantly changing. So. Yeah, I think that's the right way to go about it. I have to admit, I also have had the, oh, thank goodness I do not write contemporary <laughs> thought more than a few times um, because I have the luxury of escaping into a secondary world where, you know, I don't have to be bound to anything that happens in our world. And that's in many ways very freeing just to be like, you know what? I don't have to, I don't have to take any, any of this into account, but I think the, I think the right way to do it is, is pretty much exactly what Peter said, which is, you know, you have to serve your story first. And, um, you know, if, if your, your story is going to be best served in a world where there are no cell phones, well then, you know, you're going to write a world where there's, there's no cell phones. Um, or, you know, if you, if you, if you want to write it in a world that that is near future, then you have to accept that you're gonna get it wrong. You know, like every science fiction writer has to come to terms with the fact that whatever they write is going to be wrong on some level. Like no one yeah. has perfect, you know, forecasting. Um, and that does not detract from the greatness of those novels. Like I do not dislike, you know, Back to the Future anymore <laughs> now, even though I was, I was fed a future that didn't happen, you know? So I was lied to by I, Hollywood. I was, I, you know, my self-lacing <laughs> shoes, I was waiting for that, like all this. So, but I still love that, that series, you know, I'm perfectly capable of, of accepting that, you know, we will not have um, Star Trek world, most likely in, in the 22nd century or whatever. So, so um, so sorry, I, we're I, running I out of time. Was, I just, sorry to interrupt. We're running out of time. I just wanted to give each of you, thank you all for participating. I want to go each of you, just give us your website address so that people want to learn more about your writing. That's, you're making it easier for them. So alphabetically, Peter, what's your website? Uh, I am Peter Kleins at everything. I'm Peter Kleins on Twitter, peterkleins.com, Peter Kleins on Instagram. It's really simple. Okay. Uh, Fonda? I'm at FondaLee.com, pretty straightforward. And uh, I'm at Fonda J. Lee on Twitter. And I think same thing, Fonda.Lee uh, on Instagram. Right, Kirsten? Uh, KirstenWhite.com, it's K-I-E-R-S-T-E-N, just to you know make it challenging. And I'm also at Kirsten White on Twitter. Great, thank you all so much for participating. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.